Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, a look at efforts to curb distracted driving, promote paid family leave, and facilitate tax filing. Plus, kids call for hassle-free lemonade stands and a push for a 100% renewable energy standard. Stay tuned for this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. A bill requiring drivers to use hands-free technology when making phone calls came before the Judiciary Committee this week. We begin with a glimpse of the debate. I'm not convinced that having, having talking on the phone is as dangerous as texting. I'm afraid we're going to drive them into more texting, and I, I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do that away from, the, away from the windshield look, at least. At the very least, we can get when you've got somebody with a phone in their ear. I'm only going to read two sentences, because I want a part of the record. A 24-year-old Dodge Center man faces charges after police say he was using his cell phone when he crashed into a stopped car, killing her 43-year-old or killing a 43-year-old woman and her 8-year-old daughter. The 43-year-old woman was stopped in traffic on Highway 14, preparing to make a left-hand turn, <coughs> and this guy comes along driving a Hummer and went right over the top of her vehicle. Court documents say that Krukenberg, that is the driver of the Hummer, told investigators he had his control, cruise control set at 60 miles an hour. That's a 55 mile an hour highway, Senator Engelbretson. Cruise control set at 60 miles an hour while he's traveling west on Highway 14. Police say he admitted he was on his cell phone speaking with a friend. And when the call was over, he looked down and manually hung up the call. Senator Ingebretson, he never saw that car in front of him. Measures to diminish distracted driving are moving quickly through the Senate. Joining me to talk more about it is the chair of the Transportation Committee and author of the hands-free bill, Senator Scott Newman. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. A version similar to your bill came to the Senate floor last year, nearly passed. Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka said it wasn't quite time yet. Now this week he says this may be one of the first bills to pass this session. So what's changed? Um, I, I guess the, the only way I can answer that is uh, legislators are people just like everybody else. And sometimes it takes legislators a little time to mull things over. Uh, in my case, uh, if you had asked me about being the chief author five years ago, I probably would have said no. But I've thought about it and mulled it over, and, and I have come to the conclusion that it is time to try and convince people to put their, their phones down. Um, uh, I think other legislators are doing the same thing. And suddenly the support that wasn't there last year, uh, this year I've had legislators come up to me and say, okay, Newman, I'm ready to vote for the bill. There's a lot of evidence that distracted driving is causing accidents. Uh, is it possible, <clears throat> though, that your bill, which would just make uh, people drive using hands-free technology, so both hands can be on the wheel, is it possible, though, that this technology would still keep people distracted because they're trying to figure out how to use their technology? It's possible, but I don't believe that that is the case. Uh, and I think that the statistics will show and uh, uh, law enforcement will testify and, and frankly I think common sense will dictate that if you are not looking at your phone and you are looking out your windshield, you have your eyes on the road, uh, that you are not going to be as distracted uh, as you would be otherwise. And that isn't to say that hands-free operation of a cell phone is uh, distraction free, it frankly is, but there's a whole lot of stuff you do inside your car when you're driving that is a distraction. It's just that not looking at the road, you're looking at your cell phone to dial a number, look up a contact person, uh, you know, texting, uh, you are not looking at the road, you are looking at your phone, and that is what's so dangerous. Well, speaking of law enforcement, the state tr patrol has been in favor of this bill because 
uh, officers are talking about these roadside arguments. They pull someone over for texting and, and the driver says, no, I wasn't texting, I was dialing my phone. And so there's an argument as to what they were actually doing because texting is already illegal. Do you believe that this bill then would make it much easier for law enforcement to do their job? I do. And, and I do because uh, law enforcement has uh, told me uh, that candidly, uh, they really want this tool because it will eliminate one of the roadside arguments that uh, I wasn't texting, I was really doing a legal activity. Uh, but the truth is law enforcement, you know, they don't just willy-nilly pull you over. They are looking in and they are watching you in the car. And uh, they have a pretty darn good idea that you are paying at more attention to your phone than you are to the road around you. And that's when they pull you over. There are two bills moving right now. Your bill is Senate File 91. Senator Osmick's bill is Senate File 75. And his bill would just increase the penalties <coughs> for texting while driving. Do you agree that fines for texting should be raised? For example, right now, first offense is $50. He's arguing we need to send a stronger message to get people to stop using their phones. Um, and also, do you agree that, that if someone dies or is severely injured, it should be treated like a DUI in terms of the penalties? Well, uh, there's a couple of questions there. Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would not be in favor of just raising the penalties for uh, texting or using uh, a cell phone where it raises the penalty to a criminal act unless there's a bad accident. That's where I am in agreement with Senator Osmick's bill. So my bill does not create a criminal penalty for simply violating the hands-free position, whereas Senator Osmick's bill does for the third or subsequent offense. Where I am in agreement with on Senator Osmick's bill is that if you are using your phone in other than hands-free mode and you cause an accident because you're not paying attention to where you are going and you kill someone or you seriously injure them, then I absolutely agree that the penalty should be significantly increased. I'm not going to compare the penalties to, uh, to uh, DWI laws, uh, quite honestly. I'm not too sure what they are. But I do agree that the penalties should be significantly increased. So your concern is that the, the type of offense, whether it's petty misdemeanor or misdemeanor, not exceed what you think is appropriate for, for violating whatever these laws are. You're less concerned about the dollar amount, but about the quality of the charge much more concerned about the, the quality of the charge. And, and in, look at it this way. My bill, Senate file num number 91, I look at as being proactive. It is not a crime if, you, if this bill passes and you violate it. It's not a crime. It's a petty misdemeanor. But it's going to try and change the culture of people and encourage them to put your phone down. And I think there's lots and lots of people in this state that will agree and simply put their phone down and not have that accident. On the other hand, if you refuse and you continue to put people in jeopardy on the, that are on the road with you and the people in your car, and then you have an accident, then uh, yes, I think that those those penalties should be significantly increased when you uh, refuse to obey the law and you hurt somebody as a result. So there's been some talk of merging these two bills, but what you're laying out for me is the reason why you would like your bill to stand alone so it's not confused with some of the issues of the texting while driving bill. Is that correct? That is precisely correct, and I am not in favor of merging them. And I will oppose the, the uh, merging of the two bills while, while uh, I, I do uh, support uh, a good portion of Senator Osmick's bill. I think that they are completely independent and freestanding bills. So mine is a proactive bill. Please just put your phone down, put your eyes on the road, and keep people around you safe. However, if you don't want to do that and you want to run the risk and you hurt somebody, then Senator Osmick's bill is going to kick in and you are going to suffer the consequences. Two completely different approaches to the problem. Mine is proactive. His is reactive. You'd like to see people hang up and drive. Senator Newman, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me.
Young entrepreneurs joined Senator Roger Chamberlain to help explain the lemonade stand bill. He was a 13-year-old boy in Minneapolis. He had a hot dog stand. And the Department of Health, I believe, uh, didn't like he was selling hot dogs on his property. So they sh wanted to shut it down. The help of the police in Minneapolis, they opened the stand back up. They helped him go through the permit process, and he opened his stand back up. I'm lucky to live in the city of Stillwater, where kids are allowed to sell their own lemonade, make their own money, and not needing a permit to do it. I think kids should have the right to sell lemonade and maybe hot chocolate and fruits and vegetables. I support this bill. When looking at, all, when looking at the forum for a small-time vendor, I noticed Minnesota tax identification number, business owner social security number, federal employer identification number, and policy number. After trying to figure out what all of those numbers are, you have to pay $50 worth of fees. And as if icing on the cake, if you don't have the license, you can get fined for even more money. Honestly, I believe that gain an inspection, filling out paperwork, and paying multiple fees is asking too much from someone, someone around my age. If I was selling, let's say, popsicles, making 25 cents on each, I would have to sell 200 popsicles just to break even for the license fee. According to the Pew Research Center, more than 80% of Americans are in support of paid family and medical leave, although disagreement remains on how to pay for it. States like California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island have found a way. To talk about whether Minnesota can find a solution is Senator Susan Kent. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Paid family leave was a really big issue in 2016. It passed the Senate but failed to move in the House. I don't recall hearing anything in 2017 or 2018, but the effort has been revived with some momentum this year. Where is the energy coming from? I think it's a combination of things. I carried the bill in 2017 and 18, so it was there, but no, it didn't get a hearing, which obviously stalls a little of the energy. Um, I think more and more of us are looking around the country and realizing that this is working successfully in other states, and we really need to get serious about this here in Minnesota. We have a really looming workforce shortage, and this is the kind of thing that can very seriously help with that. And, um, you know, elections have consequences, and we have some new people at the, at the Capitol who are, are very energetic about trying to take something like this on. In what ways does this help with the workforce shortage that's coming, or actually here? Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, the, so many. First of all, when you think about paid family and medical leave, a lot of people automatically assume we're talking about old-fashioned maternity leave. But it's parental leave, it is caring for an ill family member, and it's if you, if you have your own significant illness that takes requires more time for treatment and recovery than uh, just a normal sickness. Um, so any of those things can cause somebody to step out of the workforce, and that's particularly true of women who tend to be the caregivers, whether it's for children or other family members. And so this is a way to just say, let's help workers manage these bumps in the road that we all face and then just come back and be productive once that's behind them and everything keeps rowing merrily along. So for people who are affected, it's a way to go in and out of the workforce, caring for their families with maybe less stress and uncertainty. Exactly. That is exactly what it is. The, the 2016 proposal was for an insurance program, which was funded by a payroll tax, to provide the benefit. Is the proposal this year the same idea? It's very similar. So. Um, the employee and the employer would put a little bit in, it's 0.31% of, of the salary, um, and uh, that's less than average of less than $2 a week. Uh, there's tremendous support for that type of model, up to a percent actually, three times what we're, we're, we're proposing. And then when, a, when there's a, um, a qualifying event, an illness, a leave, uh, the employee takes the time off, the employer keeps their salary, and is able to use those resources to hire somebody on a temporary basis or pay overtime for somebody to fill in the gap. And then the employee gets, based on their salary, and it's a sort of a sliding scale thing, a partial coverage for up to 12 weeks. So this is a solution then for those businesses that are maybe too small to offer leave, and yet their employees can still take the leave that they need, have some income coming in. The employer can then use those dollars 
to hire someone else to sort of smooth out these these bumps in the road as you said I'm so glad you said it like that because that's exactly what it is we see large employers all over the place doing this and they're not doing it just because they're nice to their employees which they are but they're doing it because it's good business and unfortunately that creates a, an inequity between small and medium-sized businesses who can't afford to do this on their own they don't have a large enough staff to be able to spread that out and it just it just levels the playing field for businesses now you've said that you will introduce the bill soon this session and that you're hoping for bipartisan support. Is it fair, though, to ask people who may not have families, who may never have need of this benefit, to essentially subsidize those who do? There are a number of ways in the, in the insurance world that we're used to that sort of thing. I'm happy to pay my homeowner's insurance and knock on wood, we'll never have a house fire. Um, but I'm glad it's there if I need it. And many of us will have parental leave or we have a family member who needs us there or we'll have our own illness that will require some time. Uh, we often hear about earned safe and sick time. Uh, how is paid family leave different or are these two different approaches to the same idea of allowing people the time that they need to take care of themselves or their families? Earned safe and sick time tends to be what we think of as sick time in a job. You know, it's a few days, a couple, uh, maybe a couple weeks, uh, depending on how it's structured. Very short term. For short term illnesses. These are longer term events, up to 12 weeks. And it doesn't have to be 12 weeks. There was a, a business owner who was talking about a, a, an employee of hers who had broken actually both her arms and required six weeks. And she, that's what she would have qualified for. And then she'd be happily come back at full pay and, and, and work back at the, at the business. Is there a limit on how many times this benefit can be used? There are limits in there in the way you know you qualify, the way you pay in, and the way you qualify for the benefits. Um, and so we're still working out some of the mechanics of all those. It, people keep raising really interesting questions, and I'm like, oh, I hadn't actually thought of it that way. But that is part of the process. And another thing that's really great about this is. Um, you mentioned three states. We're now up to, I think, seven states around the country that have brought this on board. And we're really learning from what they're doing and making our bill stronger um, and, and have a program that'll be really actionable when it's time to implement it in Minnesota. I think often when we talk about paid family leave, the, the first thought is women of childbearing age being able to have children. But you're also talking about, um, you know, we have the aging of the baby boomers. And I assume that the face of this as women of childbearing age could change to be anyone really that needs to take care of a family member or for their own illnesses. Right, right. exactly. Um, I heard of a family in a state where this has been offered for a few years. Um, it was a couple with a child who had special needs, both parents worked, she got cancer. So she was able to take medical leave so that she could take the time for her own treatment and recovery. Husband was able to take time as a family leave to take care of the child with the special needs and to help support his wife's treatment. After she recovered thoroughly, just a few weeks, went through her treatment, everybody went back to work and everything was back to normal. And I think that's such a great example of the way life happens. And we all have to be able to adapt. And some of us, and, and we've just had a conversation about how about, I think it's 70 or 80 percent of Americans do not have a significant amount of, of savings mm -hmm. if in case of an emergency. Um, this is a classic example of how that can really, really help families and help caregivers and help businesses because they know that it's expensive if they have to lose a good employee forever. Uh, this is just a way to adapt in the short term and everybody gets back to work as soon as everybody's well again. Senator Kent, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much. Thank you. DFL lawmakers and supporters held a Capitol press conference to push for a 100% clean energy standard by 2050. The people of this state and this country are going to ask very soon, what did we do about climate change? And the question is no longer, how can we do this or that, but how can we not? Mm -hmm. 20 years from now, they'll look back on today, I hope, and say that was the start of a new direction. And I join with Representative Long in presenting the legislation in the Senate. It's Senate File 850. And I just want to say, look at where we've been. In 2007, when the last mandate was passed, People said, you can't do that. It's going to increase the price of electricity. The price of energy went down. In 2007, they said, you're going to cost us jobs. The number of jobs created in our clean energy economy is over 50,000. Think what we can do in the next 25 years. And the biggest one, and it is personal for many of us, climate change is a hoax, they said in 2007. That ship has sailed. 
Now, I'm a greater Minnesota legislator. I'm very proud of that. And I want to say a few things to my friends and neighbors from greater Minnesota. This bill is good for us. We will put solar and wind on southern Minnesota farms. We will have northern Minnesota opportunities to build local electric generation and local energy efficiency. We will create jobs across the state, and that will be great for all of us. Where I live in North Mankato, I'm a member of Benco Electric, a classic and very well-run rural electric cooperative. I've talked to the executive director three times in the last week. This will increase the base load. Tax time is upon us and many of us are about to wrestle with the discrepancies between Minnesota's tax code and the federal tax code since efforts at conformity failed to achieve Governor Dayton's signature last session. To walk us through some of the challenges, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Revenue, Cynthia Bowerly, joins me. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I have always paid someone to do my taxes and I thought maybe this year I would save some money and try to do it myself. Are Minnesotans who generally do their own taxes going to be able to figure out the differences between the state and the federal this year? Absolutely. Uh, most Minnesotans who have a relatively simple uh, tax situation, for example, have a W-2 to reflect their wages and take the standard deduction, there are lots of options for helping you get that tax return filed with us and get any refund that you have coming, uh, including some free access to software on our website. About 90% of Minnesotans use electronic filing software and we encourage everyone to do that especially this year because for the to the extent there are differences between the federal and the state code that software will walk you through the questions that you need to answer to make sure that you are accounting for any of those differences so there's people who've always done paper you're encouraging them to get to a computer and just let the software help walk you through yes absolutely we always will provide paper if people want to provide uh, that on paper but it is much more efficient and uh, easier for us to process and uh, any, when you choose direct deposit for any refund, you'll be getting that refund a little bit more quickly than if you choose a paper uh, check sent to your house. So this is a great year to try out uh, electronic filing. On our website, if you go to the Minnesota Department of Revenue website and you put free file into our search box, you will come up with a list of certified software provider, providers here in Minnesota. And many of them offer free access to their software products for veterans, for seniors, for people with incomes uh, under about $60,000 so there's a lot of access that's available to that free software which is a great way to try it out if you haven't yet done so. So people should definitely go to your website look for more information on that. What has your department done in order to get ready for this tax filing season which is a complex season? Yes, there is. Since we've known the difference between Minnesota law and the federal law last May, we've been working closely with tax preparers, uh, members of the volunteer tax preparer community, and our software vendors to really understand what the needs were around this difference. And so we held lots of listening sessions. We published uh, resources like frequently asked questions on our website. We published the forms that we are going to be using as early as August and then final forms in October. And we worked throughout the fall with all of the those software vendors to make sure that their products will work for Minnesotans when they file their return. So we've gone through a robust round of testing to make sure, and along with all of that, we've built security into our system to make sure we're protecting taxpayers' information. So when we opened last Monday, we're confident, and what we're seeing is that over 200,000 Minnesotans have already filed their tax returns, and about uh, 3,000 have already gotten refunds. So we've sent out refunds in this first week, and so what we know is it's working, and we're going to make sure that throughout all of the filing season, people have the resources that they need uh, to get their tax refunds filed this year. Speaking of refunds, the Alexandria Echo Press reported that refund fraud attempts are on the rise and Minnesotans may have to wait a little bit longer for their refunds than maybe they're accustomed to. How is the fraud occurring and, and how much longer will people maybe have to wait? Yes, unfortunately we all probably know someone who is a victim of identity theft. And your identity of course has all of the elements that would be useful to file a fraudulent tax refund claim. And so the department's job is to make sure that when we're sending out those refunds we're sending it to the actual Minnesotan and not a criminal. And so that can take a little bit more time. Every return is different and every year is different. And so we will make sure we take the time we need. We, uh, unlike some states, we don't hold uh, claim, we don't 
hold refunds for a certain period of time. At the federal level, they hold certain kinds of refund claims uh, until the middle of February. We are processing them as we go. Uh, and so people should expect to see them in sort of what they should be used to from the last few years. We've been dealing with this problem for about five years. Um, and if we have any questions, we will send you a letter and ask you either to help verify your information, uh, your identity. Um, it could be that maybe we see a transposed number on your bank routing number. And so we're going to make sure we're checking with you to make sure we've got the right routing number. So as soon as you respond to that letter, uh, then we will be able to continue processing your return and your refund. Let's talk about businesses for a minute because there are significant changes in the federal tax code to affect businesses and Minnesota will go on as it has. What are some of the challenges maybe that businesses will face with this filing season? Sure. So at the federal level, they made significant changes to a number of provisions that affect business activity and that could be uh, pass-through entities that come on to an individual uh, return, or it could be corporate. And they made a lot of changes with respect to things like losses and depreciation and how people account for basis. And so those are things that actually affect a taxpayer more than one year. Those things carry forward. For example, if you bring a new asset into your business this year, um, with the difference between the federal and state law, the, the, you will need to account for the difference for the life of that asset. And so that's one of the conversations we're going to be having with the legislature about how to make sure we're accounting for the issues that businesses in particular are facing. Now when it comes to filing their returns for this year, again we have worked closely with CPAs and tax preparers and the software vendors to make sure that all of those systems will work. Um, we don't, you know, we don't dismiss that the federal law changed dramatically and the IRS is still putting out guidance for some of those provisions and so that can be very challenging. Uh, so we're here to help Minnesota's, Minnesota's tax preparers and taxpayers with um, uh, understanding how, given that Minnesota law hasn't changed, how the tax filing system is accommodating those differences. In the time before we have to go, uh, the legislature has indicated that they will work on these conformity issues this session so that next year will maybe be a more, little more seamless. From your perspective, what would you like lawmakers to keep in mind, just building even on your last answer, mm -hmm. as they craft new law to do conformity? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, there'll be a lot of conversations about the big policy choices in any tax bill, and the department's job is always to make sure that we are working with legislators and policymakers to help them understand the impact on taxpayers. So it's going to be important for us to have a conversation about what to do about this year, particularly for those tax items that carry forward from year to year. And so we look forward to that conversation. We know that our colleagues in the tax preparation community are also eager to have that conversation. And there's going to be a lot of different ideas on the table. And what we, our goal for the session is to get to a tax bill that will work really well for Minnesotans, um, whatever the large policy choices that are going to be made, uh, that we can administer that really well. And we'll get to work right after session to put that into place for next year's filing season. Well, I imagine this will be a busy session for you, your expertise will be relied upon by everyone and uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.